Okay, welcome everyone. I'll just read from lesson 261. God is my refuge and my security. I will identify with what I think is refuge and security. I will behold myself where I perceive my strength and think I live within the citadel where I am safe and cannot be attacked. Let me today seek not security in danger, nor attempt to find my peace in murderous attack. I live in God. In him I find my refuge and my strength. In him is my identity. In him is everlasting peace. And only there will I remember who I really am. Let me not seek for idols. I would come, my father, home to you today. I choose to be as you created me and find the son whom you created as myself. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. So we'd just like to know about your spiritual journey, what happened, and if you'd like to go back as far as you want to. I'd like to hear about people's childhoods because I think that I'd like to know whether someone's had a normal childhood or what they might call it an unusual childhood. And then just progress through, you know, what your journey in life was, what brought you to A Course in Miracles, and just things along the way that you had to deal with and how you dealt with them when you found A Course in Miracles up until now and what's happening. <laughs> wow, thank you. Big questions, and, and so I'm going to just try and get as succinct as I can. And I just feel to really come into my body to start, otherwise, I'm going to be speaking from my head, and I want to really feel it. So, I'm going to invite you also as you listen to just take a breath into your belly, and just on the exhale, just oh, let anything that you're feeling out. So, there's an invitation to listen with, as I speak. I've had an unusual journey this lifetime around and for me it actually started with at birth there's a bracelet in, in I don't know if they do it in other countries but in Australia they put a bracelet around your wrist when you're born and at birth I looked up at my hand and I, ha I was quite angry and and I heard myself say what am I doing wearing this bracelet and then I heard I caught myself saying I know the word bracelet. I know the word bracelet, but I can't tell these people that I know that that's a bracelet. And from that moment, I promised to be left-handed so I would never forget that I entered into this lifetime already knowing language and already having awareness. So that for me was the very first point of entering into this lifetime. And because of that, there was already something very deep in my field that had me in training for this before this lifetime. I lost a lot of, you know, like the memory wanes and, and fades and everything, you know, till about the age of four and I felt the energy leaving my field again. I felt that my mind closing. And that's when I searched for the bracelet again to find it because I wanted to stay connected with the knowingness that I was so much more than just this baby in a body. And at about the age of four, that got reactivated, that memory, and then Jesus showed up. And for me, I remember from then on, like, I would sleep in the bed and leave space for Jesus. I would eat food on my plate and leave some food for Jesus. I would open doors and close doors, making sure he'd walk through. And I remember going to a church with my nan once when I was about nine, seven or nine, and you know, when you walk in and Jesus is like this on the cross, you know, he's like hanging up there. He raised his head and he winked at me and he put his head back down. And I sat in the church going, did nobody else see that? Am I the only one that saw? And I got the full message that he was telling me he's not dead. And so for me, Jesus was a conscious being that was just this being that I spoke to. And I would speak about forgiveness and understanding and love and not from my mind, but from my beingness. So for me, I began this lifetime very Jesus-directed. 
and teenage years come. I wanted to be a nun for a lot of years. I was like, I'm giving my life to God. And then I met boys and I was like, that's a stupid idea. I'm uh, not giving my life to God like a nun. So I went into the dance of teenage and boys and everything. And I single parented a little girl and I moved to Byron and something really called me to the Byron area. And this is a funny story. Actually, I was cleaning a house. I'd moved into a rental property with chaos everywhere, shit everywhere. And I was cleaning the house and I found this tape and it had written on it the forgotten song. And something in me went, clean the house and when you're done, listen to this tape. And I completely cleaned, people would know Flicks Cottage that know me, you know, completely cleaned this house. And after hours and hours, I put on this tape and I heard the words, swear not to die, you holy son of God. And I exploded and I wouldn't know, now I would call that light, but my whole mind exploded and I saw the stars and I saw the planets and I got given a whole lot of information. When I came out of this experience, I ran to my neighbours not knowing what was happening and I just stood in front of them, threw my arms up in the air and just said, I don't know what's happening, but all of this, what I would now call light, was coming out of my being. And I didn't know what was happening. I was like full of this energy I knew I'd heard something that had taken me to a place that was so familiar yet I didn't consciously know how I got there or what was happening to me so I spent the next month having light headaches and, and light episodes and crazy stuff and I went down to Belongia Beach one day and this brother walked up behind me and uh, <laughs> I won't go too much into that story but his name is Amir and he walked up behind me and we met and uh, he said, come to this thing. So the next day I came and I found myself in the room studying A Course in Miracles. And for me, it was so familiar, the feeling of opening to love, the feeling of saying yes, the feeling of letting go of my thoughts was a very familiar space for me. And it wasn't until three, maybe four months into being there, one of the other students there picked up the book and they said, today I'm going to sing from the forgotten song. And I didn't know that it was from A Course in Miracles. And they opened the book and they started to read and I fell to my knees weeping because I got to see how much of a setup that I had been, this had called me long before I knew it. And I just fell to my knees weeping with so much gratitude and so much overwhelm for knowing that this was already predestined. And so the course it just called me in. I didn't really have, like, it was a setup from the get-go. So that's how I got into the course. So I'll stop there. And if you want to ask some questions, Kev, or, yeah. Um, yeah anyone got any questions I want to ask at this at this time? Okay, I'll keep going. Should Thanks. I go from course to now? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yes, yeah, and with just how you've, maybe what things have come up in your life and how you've dealt with them and just, your insights into what's been going on. Okay. So I was in the Course in Miracles with the collected, you know, group for three, four years. And for me, incredible to have this reference or this guideline to train my mind. And I recognised that the discipline, I guess, that it was offering me was something I really needed to get present and to get really clear. But what began to happen to me is that I began to deny my emotions. Annie, is you asking a question? Yeah, I am. I just um, was wondering, could you give an overview of how sort of, you, you know, basically you stepped in this room and in a sense there was an offering there that was a total commitment and in a sense, I mean, did you just start going to that straight away like every day? For a lot of us, it's like it was like the awareness of the total commitment was there from day one and we just threw ourselves right in which might be a little bit different to a lot of people's how things mm -hmm. unfold for a lot of people so I just mm -hmm. if you could talk about that a little bit first even what came up for you at the center any undoings that might have happened at the center any blocks that you saw at the center any experiences that happened when you were involved in that? Yeah. 
for me, when I stepped in, it was an instant yes. It was like, oh, these are my people. I didn't have any hesitation around it. It was just like, I didn't quite know what was happening, but the energy was so strong. And I heard things that were true. And what I loved it was with, without all the bells and whistles. Like I heard things that like, there is no death. It wasn't like a whole convoluted, you know, story about it. It was just this honest thing sentence there is no death and for me that lands in my cells like you know there's something in me that just goes oh i've always known that that there is no death i guess there were some really whole teachings that landed so honestly in my being and it didn't take much for the the resonance to be in me and they were teachings like um like god only gives like just that one sentence god um, something in my being always knew that that was true you know, so for me, I didn't question, I, I didn't quite know the, the form of it, but I didn't question the teachings because they already let, had somewhere to land in my being. And in regard to an experience, I remember in the early days having a lot of fear come up, you know, just around this and that and whatever. It was just sort of life fear and it was fear around, it was sort of every worst case scenario began to show up in my mind. And I won't go into details. But I was with a, a brother or sister, I should say now, and she she said she called me away and she said, right, now her and I stood in a room together and she said, okay, you're in this room and all your fear is in this room, like everything. And all the exits are closed. And how do you feel? And at first my response was I'm, I'm scared and I'm, you know, I was in the agitation, the fear. And she kept asking me to breathe and she kept saying, now, how do you feel? Now, how do you feel? And there was something in that guidance to stay in my fear, to breathe and to just keep inquiring, how do I feel? That began to shift it. And there was this, ah, oh, there's fear, but I feel something else. Like it shifted the relationship with fear and it it lined me up in such a way that it gave me an experience of how to be with I didn't quite realize that then but it was like to not run from the fear to actually be in it and also to not be in it just of myself call on the light that I am to call on God to call on source and in some way having that other there she was holding that pillar of light for me holding that consciousness that no matter what goes on, there is light, there is God. And, you know, it was these simple moments that actually I didn't realise, you know, at the time it was incredible and it was like a whole, like I came out wearing what I would call as the seamless garment, feeling that everything had been stripped back and there was nothing to fear. And the, the interesting thing was, as I've learned, you know, as I've grown, I've realized that that moment needs to get revisited. Like I sort of went, oh, that's it. I'm, you know, I'm done. But, uh, you know, there's always more. So my, my journey in the academy was a beautiful, full of beautiful moments. Full of real, and I love that we had each other to remind each other. There's something about being, having a constant reflection that you are love. You know, we don't really get that in the world of time space. But to, to be with committed minds that say, I commit to seeing the Christ in you and to, to feel that someone kept seeing the Christ in me and I kept coming to seeing the Christ in my brother. And it didn't mean that things didn't go askew, but it's like to stay at that point of, I want to see what's true in you and I'm willing to let you see what's true in me. You know, so in some ways there was a point of truth that ran through me from the academy. And the mind training was very good because even now there'll be lessons that, that particularly have stayed with me that helped me throughout my daily life. And one of the classics that is one of the most simple lessons is these thoughts do not mean anything. It is one of those like, you know what, when I'm in a pickle, and that doesn't mean I don't feel, but it means that I go, these thoughts do not mean anything. Like to let, you know, the busy the gripping, the try to figure it out. Like there's these particular lessons that have really stayed with me and I feel them in my body. Like as I'm speaking, I feel them in my heart and I feel them down my spinal column. 
because these thoughts do not mean anything takes me out of the busy mind and other lessons like one of the classics i'm sustained by the love of god i don't know how many times just saying that has been like oh i get to fall back into that lesson like i am sustained by the love of god like just to fall back in that when everything else is falling apart. So for me, the, the course training gave me some very powerful pillars of truth and God is the strength in which I trust. There's all these particular lessons that always, always stayed with me. But I feel that what really comes through to share is my journey after. So, you know, I came to a place in the academy where you know, I'd incubated, you know, and we were teaching to the converted, we were all teaching to the choir, and I had separated myself from the world, you know, it became like an us then, and part of me knew I needed to get back out into the world to see what happens when the rubber meets the road. Like, it's really nice to have all these teachings amongst like minds, it's easy, but who am I when I stand by myself when the rubber meets the road? How deep has that teaching really gone into my being? And for me, I left with a very broken heart. Like I, when I left the academy, I felt this pain in my heart because I was abandoning this incredible point of waking up. I felt like I literally was abandoning God again. Like it was a fall from grace. I had to leave the nest. And there was such an ache in my heart around that. It's something greater in me knew there's more coming clear. So I thought the course was the, the, the academy at such was a pinnacle of waking up. I didn't realize it was just the beginning. And so I, I stepped out of the academy and, um, you know, I was very much not anchored in the world. This is what I reference. I was on a vertical axis of light and, and I reference this and this isn't against male or female. It's more masculine, feminine, yin yang, but I reference it as a vertical pillar of light. And I was very much in, mind in mind i'm sending i'm one with god there is no world like there were these very vertical teachings that i had through my being but what i didn't realize is i was being asked to come back into the horizontal and about two years after i left i was diagnosed with a cancerous tumor in my womb and when that occurred to me i had this attitude of oh i I got this. I just need to go in and forgive. I just need to go in and forgive the stuff and this is going to clear in a heartbeat. You know, there was a naivety about me and bless me that I just was like, okay, God, I'm, we're going to do this. I got this. I had no idea that that was setting me up for a 20-year journey into my womb space. And when I say womb space, what I'm talking about is my emotional body place where I hold all of the the pain the guilt the shame the passion the pleasure like all of those things that I'd gone to God on the vertical but I didn't realize there was a horizontal like a, what is it to wake up in the feelingness what is it to to really be with my pain and literally what I've discovered is when I stand in the vertical and the horizontal together within myself, I form the perfect cross. And in the center of that cross, I have the vertical reference of what's true. And I have the horizontal of my feeling body. And together for me, that is the Christ consciousness. So I access the vertical of, I know I'm not a body. And yet I stand in the horizontal of, and here I am in a body. And I'm not running from myself anymore. I'm not going to God because this hurts too much. And, and you know, it's a willingness to, to I was feeling into it yesterday, there's a place where we, we recognize we have to be in the crucifixion to experience the resurrection. So the ascension to jump out of our pain, like let me grab a lesson so I don't have to convert this. Let me, I'm not a body, I'm not a body, and disconnect from the body, which is an information package. Like when I say the word I'm not a body, for me it's like I'm not just a body, but this is an information package. 
which is going to tell me when I'm stressed, when I'm scared, when I'm sad, when I'm joyous, when I'm happy. It's the feedback. And it's time to include that as a part of the collective, like the wake up. Like when Christ went to, to the crucifixion, he didn't stay up there going, laughing, going, I'm not a body. This is great. I'm not a body. He totally felt it. He was like, I am feeling every bit of pain that there is. And I am being with that pain because I know the being with is the activation of the crucifixion, the, the resurrection. So I guess in that my sharing is like to, to be with that crucifixion and bring the resurrection resurrected consciousness into that and hold both principles together and allow for the feeling of the of the trauma allow for the feeling of the pain and bring with that the knowing of you are whole and healed and perfect and bring through the knowing that I am innocent and bring through the knowing that I'm not a body but by staying in my body to feel it completely. And so the greatest gift that this journey of cancer has given me, and you know, the funny thing is in my mind, I was like, oh, I want to heal this. I have an idea. Healing looks like I get rid of this. I need to heal this. I've accomplished something. I'm like, wow, if I can get rid of this, then that'll show me that I'm loved. That'll show me that I'm worthy. That'll show me that I'm pure and I'm whole. And fuck, that, that, that just took me to my knees because I got to see that I still think that I need to perfect something to receive the love of God. That I won't be getting God's love until I'm healed. I won't be getting my brother's love until I'm healed. And the learning I got is that, Claire, healing isn't about trying to get rid of something. Healing is about being with. And ultimately being the love, like it really took me to this learning of how can I show up as love and just touch that point that fears me the most, that I fear the most. Just touch it, not to shift it, not to even try and heal it, not change it, but how can I be the love that sits with the most painful part of my being? And so I, I feel so blessed that this thing that the world would say is here to kill me was actually the gift that has, has given me a complete healing. And so I stand in that now in this part of myself of, of wanting to really live that, the Christ in myself from the, the ascension, from the masculine and from the, the, the horizontal, the embodiment, the feminine. I want to feel both of that. And, when, you know, when Jesus says greater things will you do than I, he, he, he crucified, resurrected, and ascended. But here we are, crucifixion, fiction, resurrection, and we stay here until there's nothing that we would even need to descend from. And for me, that has been the biggest goal, that what is it to to come to that place in ourselves where I don't need to clean anything up. I don't need to fix it. I do need to heal it. I just need to be with it with absolute love. Hold myself with absolute unconditional love. And there is no other moment than this together. What is that for us to do that with each other, with ourselves? And say, you know what, that's, that's how close Christ is in us. In this moment. And just stay there and let breath go where it needs to go. And the funny thing is we've made this waking up journey so hard spent lifetimes trying to achieve something but now finally we're actually stepping back and letting it hold us and finally saying in my heart 
I'm ready to let the Christ in me completely step in. And just let it love all the parts of me that I thought were unlovable. And I'm willing to see that in my brother. And I'm really willing to stand in a place where the idea of who I am, it gets, it's dissolving. And, and I'm, I'm bigger and brighter than I thought I would ever be. There's no actually no thought in it. But there's this willingness to go beyond the human idea of who Claire is, what my body is, what time and space is. Like show up being the impossible. Show up being the absolute impossible. And the, the amazing thing is in, in the knowing of the dream state, we can be all and more. And that's my call to myself and to everyone, to go beyond what you think you think you are in time and space and to start letting this love flow through you that has always been within you and just let it touch all the parts of you that you didn't think could be touched just hold nothing back from love let it consume you completely because there is no more ascending to god it's within you right now in the fullness of you And I feel that at this time on the planet, you know, I was really feeling into the whole COVID thing. You know? I was walking through the forest yesterday and I thought, what a perfect design of separation. You know, the pendulum swings one way. Like we, we love to get ourselves in a pickle so we wake up. You know, we forget to remember more. And I was looking at the whole idea of the COVID stuff and I'm like, what a perfect design of separation. It's so perfectly designed. Like, we have to be separate before we get it, if we get it. Then if we get it, we then have to be more separate. And it's the ultimate, like, even death is more attractive than being in the separation that COVID idea offers. You know, and I love that design. It's like, oh, my God, what a consciousness that we've gone. What could I design that would bring the most amount of separation I could fathom? And here it is. Here it is. It, this, this is that moment that we go, oh, look at, look at what my mind did. It created separation and separation and separation. And the answer that I give to that is, I know who I am in truth. And just stay in that knowing. And when we forget, oh, let me fall back. Let me, let me really fall back into who I am in truth. Let me take a breath. Let me, these thoughts do not mean anything. God is the strength in which I trust. There is no death. Let me bring that vertical, like the, uh, I know Hector uses it as the, um, says there's a particular word, revelation. Let me use the revelatory mind to access the miraculous in time and space. So use, use that. Use that vertical, the teachings and everything, but use them so that you learn how to convert the time-space energy that's coming at you. And, and don't forget to laugh. Like, this is a funny game that we play, but, oh, my God, do you think we could make separation any more intense? Look what we just did. The mind went, hang on, this isn't enough. I'm going to make this really intense. And why? Because, because we're ready to remember. And where two or more are gathered, man, where two or more are gathered, there's nothing that we can't do. And the, the recognition of joining with Christ consciousness, joining with source, joining with each other, we have no idea of the energy that that enters back out into the collective field. Like when two minds join in knowing, who they are in truth, knowing that they're loved, knowing that all is forgiven, knowing that they are the peace of all creation. When two minds join in that, the energy that that sends out to all minds, because there is only one mind. And this is the journey we are on.
This is our time of awakening. Impossible is here. We are that. Any questions? <laughs> I feel like it's time to meditate or something. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions or comments they want to make? I have a question. Claire, you said that you had cancer for 20 years or did I mean that misunderstood? Yes, that, that's right. Yeah, and so were you treating it? Did you do something or you were just, I don't know, trying to experience how it feels or were you actually going to the doctor, had a surgery or chemo or whatever? No, it's a funny journey. I just kept following the prompts and the first few stages of it, I found myself off in the south of France. And without knowing it, I was following a Magdalene timeline, which I didn't actually quite realize. Um, you know, it was 20 years ago and see Cole, and um, I just was following my intuition. And it was like, go to this church and pray, go to that church. And what I was doing was accessing the feminine energy. And then I ended up in uh, Israel at the Dead Sea and um, at the, the, you know, Jerusalem, and I did all that. So for me, um, and, and it was a big risk, and I know everyone was telling me, you're mad, and you need surgery, and da-da-da, but for me, personally, it wasn't death that freaked me out. It was not waking up, and I just felt like this has come for the perfect opportunity for me to heal. Like, I saw it as this package that had all of my pain, and all of my suffering and all of my struggle. And it sort of held Claire story and then lineage and then collective. And I, you know, I sat with God and I was like, you know, I don't know what to do with this. I literally, when I was diagnosed, I spent five days in bed saying, until I feel God leading me, I'm not getting out of this bed. Um, you know, and I just sat there and then I just got this energy that just moved through me that said, I got you, I got you. And, and it kept saying, don't, don't take your womb out stay with what and you know it's really funny because I, I could have taken my womb out and maybe it would have stopped it maybe it wouldn't but for me that wasn't what I knew I wanted to look at what I wanted, you know it was like I want this opportunity to heal all the stuff that over lifetimes I have suppressed in my being and you know luckily I mean bless there were many times when you know ambulance came to get me and I'd you know, collapsed and I bled everywhere and I was, you know, on death's door and luckily someone had walked in the house and called an ambulance and put me on blood supplies and oxygen tanks and get me back up and the amount of times I freaking, you know, and, and it was funny, I did go um, once, I, so I've had no chemo or no surgery and I did once go to hospital, I mean, I did go a few times, you know, just to keep an eye on it and stuff and there was this one particular time that, I was completely knocked out. You know, I, I'd lost so much blood and um, I had been on a, in a battle literally with um, sort of around the witch hunt energy came through and I literally felt this witch energy scraping the inside of my womb and there was all this. So every time information comes through, I'm taken to a place of deeper forgiveness, like forgiving the whole package, the whole timeline, the whole, so it's radical work and this one knocked me out, you know. Um, I was home alone. It was it was a perfect setup. I was home alone, and my flatmate had gone to Sydney, and I was completely fucked. Dare I say it? And I'd collapsed, and you know, um, and somehow someone I can't even remember how they managed to find me and rushed me to hospital. And I got there, and, and the doctors were like, "All right, immediate surgery tomorrow. We're going to go in and give you the golden cure, which is take out some of my bowels and womb, and you know, the whole kit and caboodle." You know? And I was there and the prayer was, I am sustained by the love of God. Um, that's cool, Annie. Yeah. And, and my prayer was, I am sustained by the love of God. Like I just, I just was there. And the nurses, like it was this feeling of angelic. 
you know, like in this surrender. And I just was like, I can fucking, here I am, God, you know, even the, like I don't want to outrun that. You know, maybe I'm spiritual, maybe I'm spiritually stubborn and finally you got me. I'm in the hospital. I say yes. And the doctors walked in and they, they um, said, right, you need to fill out these forms. And I filled mine out. And the Course in Miracles was by the bed. And the doctor reached over and he said, oh, can I write, you know, use this book? And as soon as he picked up the course, I just was like, this is given. This is, I said, yep, you can, you can, you can use that book to sign. Something in my whole being knew that when he picked up the course and filled the paperwork out on that book, I was taken care of. It was just this moment when I went, oh, it's all in God's hands. Like what book? There were magazines. You could have picked up anything to sign on that he picked up. And just him touching that book, I mean, for me, that book is a frequency, you know. Like sometimes I just sleep with it under my pillow just to get the the energy. So when he signed on the book, I was like, all right, it's in God's hands. And so I'm off, you know, getting ready for surgery tomorrow and, you know, kneel by mouth and all that stuff. And the doctors came in the morning. And they looked at me and they go, wow, you're looking really good. And I said, yeah, I feel really good. And they went, look, we're going to let you go and come back in three months later and we'll do it then. And I looked at them. I said, if you let me leave, you know, it's going to be really hard to get me back in here. And they said, look, just go. You look good. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. But for me, it was one of those like Abraham moments, you know, when Abraham goes to kill his son. And he's got the axe and God's like, no, no, you don't have to do it now. It was like this moment of, for me to see my own willingness to completely surrender, to be like, okay. And to, I had such a diss against surgery and the, the, you know, medical world. And, and, and I had to include that in as well. That's my mind. I created the medical world. That's my consciousness. I have to forgive myself for all of that the good and the bad in that. So it was like this beautiful, you know, include everything in Claire. And I I did used to have a thing in me where I I sort of fought the idea of surgery because I'm going to heal this and I've got to heal this. I mean, I tell you what, my ego has been slammed in this, my ego that, that, that can heal stuff, you know, the me that thinks I'm doing something. And my ego must be huge because the amount of times I've been slammed is ridiculous, you know. So, And there's probably more to come. So, you know, like I really had to look at why am I fighting the surgery? And I remember having this day where I was like, I really need to see what's going on behind the scenes. And often I'll go into a lot of prayer. I, 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 because of this, I spend a lot of time just on my yoga mat and prayer. You know, I, I light incense and I just say, okay, God, you know, we need to chat. And I got to see a particular past life where I was literally standing covered in blood with my womb being taken. And I heard the words, if they take my womb, they take my magic, they take my medicine. If they take my womb, they take my medicine. And it was a, it, an apparition of this woman before me. And I went into the yoga room and I held her in my arms and I rocked with her. And I said, sweetheart, your medicine has nothing to do with your womb. No one can take your medicine. And I've rocked that part of myself and that part of all women and that part of all men that has been through this feeling of having something taken from us leaves us helpless. So, you know, I feel like right now in my my journey, there's not such a fight in me against the medical world, yet I'm still following the prompts. And um. I noticed too with the tumor, when I'm um, really sad, it actually grows. Like I've actually, you know, I've gone through really sad moments and the tumor grows. And then I get happy and it sh- starts to shrink. And I'm like, you know, this is, this, it's speaking, it speaks to me. But I recognize now as I listen better, I don't always need it as a teacher. You know, the more I can listen to what's really going on, the less I need that, that, that particular stop sign or that particular signpost to give me the feedback. So uh, at this stage, no, I haven't had surgery. I haven't had chemo. Um, last time I checked, they say the tumor is still there, bless its little heart. And I just, I'm just like, thank you, God. Like, thank you, God. What, what more can I say? I'm like, man, thank you, God. 
Like I've been given everything, everything, man. This was a lifetime that I didn't know was coming, but something in me just said yes to it. And I'm so freaking grateful. I'm so freaking grateful. I can't, I, I'm just, you know, the thing that was the most pain has given me such a blessing and such a gift. And it helped me access for me what I call the feminine wake up, which is honoring the emotional body, honoring the, the feeling, honoring, and I don't mean female, male, I mean the feminine, masculine, which are in all of us. But it helped me include my feeling and my emotions, which I've often shunned as being bad and leading me astray. And don't be emotional, just wake up and stay with God. But now it's like, no, no, come in emotions. Let me, let me just be with you. Let me be in the tenderness of that. You know, and I feel like there's more to come. It's so exciting. I got up this morning. I watched the sunrise. It's 8, 8. And I stood with all these other beings and we just called in the Christ consciousness within ourselves. And we just stood there in freaking celebration. Like, my God, if ever there's a time to show up, now's the time. This is what we came in. My whole body is just fucking open to this. I'm like, I came here for this. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. So you didn't use uh, any kind of medicine except that uh, during the time when you were taken to the hospital, right? Well, at the hospital, I had drip blood transfusions. I have had uh, taken some THC oils, and I found the oils good for taking me underneath my, like, like at first I was a bit like I don't want to get stoned I did that when I was younger I'm like oh the last thing I want to do is be a stoner but because I dedicated okay this is a journey for healing it was more shamanic so I would you know it would take me into places of myself and and I would write a lot and I'd realize the subtleties like I, I remember being in you know in the journey of the THC having this moment where I got to see part of me wanted to heal this so I could say dad dad look what a good guy I am Look what I've achieved something. I healed cancer. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, fuck, bless my heart. Don't, I still don't think I'm good enough until I've healed this impossible thing. I don't think I'll get the love of my dad until I've proven myself. Like, you know, so it's sort of the THC helped me catch all these little unearthings of my thinking, um, you know, in subtlety. So I did some THC, but... For me, I can't do it for too long because then I sort of get nothing done and I, and I don't always feel good being stoned. And the other thing I have done a bit is um, uh, needles every second day into my belly of um, st uh, not stinging, uh, mistletoe, mistletoe. And that's a German um, chemo. It's like a natural chem chemo they've discovered. And they use the mistletoe, the, the energy of the mistletoe, and I inject it into my belly and into my body, and it shows up like a chemo. So it sort of, you know, does all its magic on the, the cells. And, um, and I've watched it shrink that as well. But, you know, it's really funny. The way my mind works is, is different from most that, like, I have to get this away from me. You know, like, I know there's no death. Fucking whatever it's like I want to learn waking up is like like I want to I want to heal I want to I want to take love to that place where they told me I couldn't take love that's what I'm here for you know so and if I get shown to do other stuff along the way I might but I've never been um really like go cut this out I could you know who knows tomorrow later today I'm, I'm not set on how it needs to look I did have a question mm -hmm. Claire, but I think you answered right at the end there that someone in the group's got cancer. They're not you're not saying don't get medical stuff done. You're just saying whatever you follow your own heart. Yeah. Absolutely. Like I'm not here to advocate do what I did because part of me was damn ass stubborn, you know, like <laughs> I'm designed in a particular way. So I had to follow my intuition and it did, you know, I had a lot of people leave my friendship field because of what I was doing was too radical. But I also totally respect someone that's like, right, I need to go get surgery and get this out. Like, and that's where it's a very personal decision. And I would definitely honor that, that you just follow your own intuition. And, and the interesting thing is 
like God's in everything I see because God's in my mind. So if I need to go get surgery, then that's going to be the greatest God moment I can have. But I, for me, I was just following what I was, um, what I was being shown and directed to do. Claire, I'd have to sort of reiterate that's for all of us. Like the guidance is primarily what's important. And also just that we have those fundamentals of the teaching in mind where Jesus is saying healing is not of the body. You know, we're healing all our belief in separation and all the forms that comes up in and that the miracle may not have observable effects. Sometimes whatever seems to be going on in the body can be seemingly taken away but all our pain is not because some cells are growing into a lump all the pain is in our mind from that one idea that we could be separate and we're separate from our brother and we're separate from anything at all so we're going back that's really the source of all of our pain and guilt and all that emotional content that we're being readied or we've been ready to meet in us and we're willing to sit still and enter into however that's given us to do and it is very individual and the prompts and the guidance is very individual and it's really important in the face of the whole world saying don't do that that we follow how it's given for us because he knows the way and how we're wired to undo a hundred percent and my heart just sings hearing you say that because totally you know and the prompts can be so random and radical you're like what I have to go and do this thing like but everything's telling me no I have to quit the job or move house or whatever the prompt is and and I love too what you say there about like it's healing separation like I am healed how does my body show up that's sort of irrelevant you know I'm not in the symptoms of this I am so freaking healed it's ridiculous I am so happy and so grateful and I constantly know I'm connected to source. You know, I'm constantly in prayer. And, and when I'm not and I fall off, it's so close for me now. So it's like, yeah, it's not the, the idea of healing the form. You know, the idea of healing the form, it's like, thank you, form, for showing me where I was stuck. That's the job of the form. But the healing is that I'm not separate from source. I'm not separate from my brother. This is one mind of consciousness. And alleluia. Yeah, that's pretty much. I'm also grateful to um, Claire, just all those subtleties because it gets more subtle and where our judgments are being held in place, our judgment for something. So this is okay and this and against something, this isn't, and how that has to be cleaned up because all our judgments for against or against something solidifies the world in our mind and as they're undone. It loosens everything in us and our minds are freed to be and shine that line and be in a consistent state of peace and then integrated. As you say, there's nothing more to escape from then. We're not trying to escape. Everything's been brought home in us and our minds are integrated and healed because all the judgment for or against is released and that becomes more and more subtle. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I found that I think there's different stages in it too. Like in the, you know, as we mature, there is that willingness to include all sides of the equation and be like, oh, the medical world, oh, that's my mind too. Like I made COVID in that sense. And I'm the doctor's fighting, like I'm all of that. And there is no for and against, you know, but I find healing is a funny dance. Like for me, it was a mixture of, yes, embracing the idea of the wound like to embrace it but equally knowing that I'm not the wound and so equally knowing when to deny it and when to embrace it you know like I find I find that's a subtle dance like if I embrace the wound too much it's like I get lost in it and I'm wound healing wound you know if I deny it too much I can't I can't get into it so it's like how can I sit with my wound and still remember I'm not that and yet I'm embracing that. It's like the paradox of the, the waking up, like both things come together and there's a subtlety in knowing when to say, okay, I'm done. I, I've looked at this story for long enough and 
I've looked at it in a thousand million ways and I'm ready to just let it go in its entirety. Like, like I find that's always something I'm learning. Um, you know, when is it valid to sit with something and feel? And when was it, when is it time to go, okay, enough is enough, you know? Um, and, and that's just a beautiful dance of, of calling more God consciousness into everything I'm doing. So, yeah, it's pretty, man, what an epic time to be here, you know. And and our capacity grows, as you so, say, Annie, the more in the subtleties of, like, you know, the no for and against, the more our capacity grows to be, I can be with all of this, you know. And even at the moment there's this vaccine, anti-vaccine. Part of me is like I, I, I don't really care. And I know that's a terrible thing to say right now. It's like, you know, if, you, if someone needs to vaccine, man, bless your heart, go for it. If you don't, bless your heart, like, it's not about that. And, and for me, that's not my battle, you know. Like the world at the moment, I feel like it's calling us to pick a position to battle from. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not that. And, you know, for me, it's like there's no battle to have here. It's a remembrance of, of who I am. And, you know, for me, The Course is one of those beautiful books that just keeps me activated in that remembrance. And not just The Course. There's lots of other stuff I do, but... Yeah, that's, you know, there's no, there's nothing to be in battle with anymore. It's just like coming back to, oh, let me remember. And sometimes when I'm really struggling, I just go to bed and I hold myself and I just repeat the word Jesus. Just say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> you know, when all else fails and it works. Do you know, like it doesn't have to be like we've made it, like it's a hard thing and it's like, no, actually, and I guess that's the piece to willingness. Like it's the willingness that gets us over the line. Like we come with all this stuff and I need to figure this out and I need to figure this out. But for a second, I just need to be willing to remember my true nature. And from that place, then I can look at the stuff, like seek first the kingdom and then take a look. I'm going to pop the stick back down and just take a breath. I just saw your message, Annie. It might be a bit late to talk to that. Maybe we'll do another Zoom for the sex part. <laughs> Annie just slipped in a sex question. I'm like, thanks, Annie. <laughs> Kevin will really like that because he's convinced The Course in Miracles is completely Jesus's book, pornographic book. Everything is pornographic in A Course in Miracles. All the, all the lessons, everything Jesus says. Oh, it's just a little joke we have in there. <laughs> God is the strength in which I trust. Okay. The light of God is shining in me now. That's pretty pornographic. <laughs> All right. Not everything. I might have exaggerated <laughs> a little bit. It was just one particular morning in our group. But something came up and it was interesting. Everything sounded like it was pornographic on that particular day. It's, it um, is incredibly intimate though, isn't it? I mean, I think when we really get into the subtleties and there's, there's something I term my intimate frequency. And it's like that place where I'm in communion with God and, and nature is there and Maybe a beloved is there and there's this beautiful intimacy of, of self and it's sensual and it's sexual, but it's not gripped and it's not like an irritated sexuality. And Annie just asked me about sex and the tumour. I won't go into it too much, but um, it got me to look at where I held my shame and it got me to look at the shame of desire. And it also got me to look at one of the things the tumour helped me look at was where I was scared to create. It was like I'd blocked my creative potential in the womb space because there's this feeling in me that I didn't want to create a world of denying God. 
So I stopped creating altogether because I was really scared that time and space, I taught myself that, you know, everything I do here is a denial of God. And that was misusing a teaching to shut my own light down, but I didn't know that for a very long time. So it took me a long time to see that, oh, I've, I've sort of frozen in a space of, you know, everything I do here is an attack on God. Time and space is an attack on God. Everything is the ego playing out. So I'll just freeze and do nothing. And I thought that was the best option. And it took me a long time to realise, no, actually, Claire, it's okay to be here. And when I'm coming from my heart, my truth, I'm not denying God. I'm the extension of God. And so I got to see it. So it is a longer, like some of the, the teachings of the tumour were um, how am I holding back my creative, co-creative essence of life force? And on the sexual level, where am I seeing the desire to join with another as a shameful idea? Where am I, you know, saying my, my desire for that is not godly and, and it's shameful and, and all those sorts of things. Just touching on that briefly. Thank you. I'd just like to reiterate what you're saying about the intimacy, Claire. I call this the joy of joining this talk with you because there is that joining with our brother and there's something happens in the joining where there is this intimacy because it's a joining of mind and it goes far beyond you know we try to be intimate through the body and when we truly join in mind with our brother the intimacy that is experienced is just it's unspeakable there's no words for it it's just like the intimacy that we try to feel through some sort of joining with the body or in form just doesn't even start to come close to the intimacy that's experienced when we truly join with our brother in mind. It's unspeakable. There's kind of no words for it, but there's just this intimacy. It's amazing. It is a powerful thing, isn't it, when we experience that joining. And I know some of you know Amir, who is a dear brother of all of ours. And Amir passed away, not this may gone but the one before and Amir was like you know the love of my life he was my beloved dear brother that I hadn't seen for a lot of years and uh he passed over and you know I mean he's here right now he's so strong the connection that I share with him you know he's not in form so it's not about the the friction based or the physical form but the intimacy that I share with him now is profound and the communication, I mean, this is the thing, you know, we live in a funny world where communication is I pick up my phone or I look at something on screen or I, you know, chat to someone and say something, but there's a divine communication that when we slipstream our, our mind into that, we access this, this intimate frequency of communication where everything is just fluid and effortless. And it's such a divine way of, of being with each other and it doesn't exclude the body and so I don't see that joining on that sexual level there's nothing wrong with it but to not be fooled by the the true joining is that beautiful frequency of oh there you are I just tuned in with with your essence and you tuned in with my essence that source essence so for me that true joining nothing beats it I mean, you know, like we can, we can do everything. And I guess my journey really taught me that because I couldn't mess about anymore with the physical friction-based connection. It was like, no, this has to be the real deal. This has to be the, the true joining with minds. And, um, yeah, so when two or more are gathered is, is, a true, is a true statement. And that doesn't mean, um, you know, like... Amir is so-called not in the body and he's probably one of the strongest communicators I still know. You know, that hasn't stopped him from dropping in and saying hello. 
and really sharing what's going on. So I think this is this is knowing that we're not limited and really exercise that muscle, you know, exercise that muscle in your heart and in yourself of like what is it to commune in this intimacy, this delicate, beautiful intimacy. And then we do it with the plants in the garden and we do it with the the sky and we do it with the beings and the, with the pets and the everything. It's like everything is this intimate delicate incredibly exquisite field of light around us and we're here to to be about that and celebrate it you know like in some ways the 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 resurrection the crucifixion but then there's the transfiguration and that's what we're saying yes to now the transfiguration where we 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 be that pristine within the dreaming and we bring that through and we remember the love that we are regardless of all of our thoughts. Beautiful to see you all here today. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll put the stick back down. I'm, we're probably nearly done, yeah? Yeah, I was sort of feeling, unless anyone's got any other question, that it's time to wrap up. And um, just for the recording, when Claire says she's putting the stick back down, she's talking about muting. Nothing not, not stopping her you know, whacking. Yeah, nothing sexual or whacking herself over the head with something. Though <laughs> so that's being put down too. I've, before you go, Claire, I've actually got something. I'm not sure if it's a question or not, but it was interesting to hear you talk about Jesus on the cross feeling the pain because I've heard a few people talk about, a lot of people actually think that Jesus felt no pain on the cross and they say it with such authority. I always find my little voice in my head saying, how do you know? <laughs> you weren't there. Even the people who say they were there, I still sort of have trouble with. The best story I've heard so far is someone said that, one group of people said they saw Jesus sitting over in a tree watching the whole thing unfold. And I thought, yeah, I like that one best. So, um, and, I'm, and as I'm thinking about it, it reminds me of the um, teacher's manual that talks about reincarnation. It's like, see, neither here nor there, other than the fact that it's, if, it, if it's a good teaching for you, it's like it, it, it's, it's for you personally. Do you want, what would you say to that? Um, I, I would reiterate that it's personal, however anyone interprets. And the interesting thing is, Today, the interpretation might be that, oh, we felt a lot of pain, and tomorrow it might be we felt nothing, and both are equally applicable because they're unlocking what needs to be unlocked within self. And for me, I've always experienced it as pain, um, and I've had the experience of literally being at his feet as well and doing all of that. And it's an interesting journey. What I feel or was shown or whatever is that it was a dance of both. It was pain and it was awake and it was pain and it was awake. And, and I feel this is more of a feeling than anything. What would be the point of it if it wasn't painful? Like we, like he's the demonstration of how to get through that most, like, like when you're in the thick of things, you know, when you're really on your, like for me, that's what the crucifixion is. It's like everything is coming at me from all directions. I am in the suffering of everything. I need to remember my true nature. So, so for a teacher, what would be the point that he's in the middle going, oh, this is sweet, this is great, you're all good. Like, how, how is that going to land for us? Like, he, he came to be a demonstration so we could feel that and we can relate to that and we can go, fuck yeah, I feel that too. Like, and, and the funny thing is this isn't easy. You know, eventually it's a walk in the park and you're over on the tree looking at it and going, I'm sweet. But we have to get honest with where we find ourselves, you know. We, there are moments when I'll break down and cry and I'll scream and I'll feel it all. But the funny thing is it's like that teaching that he sat in the tree, for me it excludes that, that we are here in the feeling of all of this. You know, is our rage as unequal as our joy? Is my, are my tears, are, you know, like there's a good and bad in that. Maybe he was in it to feel the full experience of what it is to fucking feel everything and to hand it all over. And, and I give myself permission to do that. And I feel like for me, that's what he was doing, permission to feel it fully and to keep offering it up and saying, God, I want to feel you in amongst all of this pain. I want to feel you. 
So I think on the demonstration purpose, it, it would make sense that it was an inclusion of pain rather than a, oh, I'm bypassing, I'm sweet, I'm out of here. There would be no point for him to show up in the dreaming, in, in my understanding. That's really good, like the way you said, like it was personal, it reminded me because I have a completely different understanding with it and was sort of shown there was no suffering on the cross and that and also other friends. And what's really cool about it is us bringing up the idea that it is really personal and there is no facts in perception. Knowledge is of the kingdom and that's it of reality as Jesus really points out in the course so that's where the only you know you can only really go and join in love and in and knowledge is of the kingdom even though our understanding seems to grow and things in perception that's where true knowledge is that's unequivocal certain and there's no question in it See, any question that arises is part of the ego's framework where we can say, oh, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. It's, there's a, no certainty in it. And so it's really good to, as a great demonstration, that, that idea that it's personal. We're given what we've needed at a certain time for our understanding or what's helpful for us and not to make a fact out of it. Uh, because Absolutely. there's no facts in perception mm. uh, because it's not, not reality. Yeah, and, and that's the beauty. Oh, sorry, I just want to add to that. That's the beautiful thing is there's no right and wrong. I, I'm going to interpret it in the way that I need to unlock me. Um, and so that's where it's like let everyone have their own experience because that's where they're going to be unlocked with it. But the interesting thing is even in that question, I have to ask the same question of myself. Am I sitting on the tree laughing or am I in pain? And the answer would be both. There is a part of me that is sitting on the tree watching Claire do this and laughing her ass off or his ass or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, there is that. So I am that and I'm also in his suffering. So what was Jesus doing? Probably both. All right, um, I think that's about it. Then anyone else got any, any burning questions they didn't get out they wanted, they didn't, didn't get to ask? No, I think we're all good. Well, thanks very much, Claire. It was a pleasure having you on. It was a pleasure being here. What a blessing, hey? What an absolute blessing. Thank you. Uh, do you want to just have five minutes quiet together before we sign off and just sit quietly and join in the communication? that's being offered.
Okay, thanks everyone. Yay. Thank you, Claire, that was lovely, thank you. Oh, my pleasure, thank you everyone. Enjoy a beautiful 8-8 celebration, yay, thank you. <laughs> so much love, awesome. Bye everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks, thanks Claire.